Hello, everyone, and welcome in. It's Aaron St. Dennis at FF Mad Scientist, joined by Jesse Moeller at jmoeller05. We are here to recap all of the uh, Week 14 games. How's it going, Jesse? It's going good. Um, it was a pretty wild week, looking back on it and all the things that happened. But, you know, hopefully you got into the playoffs or you're on the verge of making the playoffs in the two games coming in tonight because I had some chaos go last night in my home league, my most important league. That fumble cost me a buy, the Devonta Smith fumble. I was like, mother like we had it, fumbled it. Yeah, so I'm still not over that. But overall, it was a good weekend. Would you believe with the okay? So I'm in 71 leagues, with the exception of the one league that was already in the playoffs and Scott mm -hmm. Fishbowl, where I was already eliminated. Every other league, I had nothing to play for yesterday. Wow. I was the wild. games where the leagues. I think I was only there's only two leagues where I'm already eliminated, where I'm I didn't make the playoffs out of 71, which I thought was impressive. Considering yeah. I, I think I just proved that I may, I'm my own worst enemy with uh, with uh, lineups because this year when I put no effort into actual research and just went with my gut, I'm I'm in the playoffs in like 68 out of 71 leagues. But so um, so I the leagues where I missed the playoffs, I couldn't have made the playoffs. There was one where I'm I'm gonna finish out of the playoffs. I could have theoretically made. I won. The other guy lost, but I had to outscore him by like 275 to make it. So it was like no. Um, then pretty much every other league, I think I was already like I looked and I went through and it's like, well, can't do anything. I like, couldn't really move up the leagues where I was first, second, or third. It was like, well, I've already clinched that. There were no real mm -hmm. first round buys in a lot of my leagues, so I had a lot of leagues where I didn't really have a whole lot to play for. Which is amazing. Was I looked nice. through and I was like, was really nice. the one league my it looks like I uh the Frankenstein League looks like that came to an end for me this week. That was the league that started the playoffs, and I had um no quarterback this week. Well, I had Trevor Lawrence, but I don't know if he counts as a quarterback this week. And then I had like I think I had three of my main starters were Lions players, and that didn't work out well. I looked at everyone was at like 220 and I'm at 45, and I'm like, oh, yep. Bad time to have a bad week, so. Yeah. Very much so. <laughs> yeah, I had like six or seven games deciding a potential buy where it's like tweener, like you're a two seed or a three seed and you're on the verge. So wow. I've got a few of those games going on tonight, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. But yeah, the majority of stuff was already decided. Just it was the calm few before. games there. I was like, oh, <clears throat> yeah. Calm before the storm for me. Completely anticlimactic. One of those weeks where I just sat there and said, don't have any of my major players get hurt. Lost her. Aside from that, I think I came through it all right. Uh, let's go. Our first preview we're going to do Tampa Bay, Atlanta. Who would have thought this was a barn burner? 29 25 Tampa, both teams six and seven in a three way tie for the NFC South League. <laughs> Excuse me, I got the hiccups today in the NFC South. Uh, I'm just looking something up here, 2023 standings, unless you have it off the top of your head. I know it's a three-way tie. Do you know who's mm -hmm. leading the NFC South by tiebreaker? I don't. I honestly don't. I'm I, was just, just I don't know that. either, and I'm a Saints fan, so I'm going to look it up. It is Bucks, Falcons, Saints in that order. So go figure. Interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's it's just an ugly division. One, yeah. one of those teams is taking it. I don't know who it's going to be, but one of them is taking it. So we start off the quarterbacks were surprisingly, you know, decent, probably top 12 here, uh, given how bad they both, you know, are. Baker had 144 yards and two touchdowns, also added in a rushing touchdown. Desmond Ritter had 347 yards and only one touchdown, did also add in a second rushing touchdown. So both quarterbacks did what you needed out of them. Both running backs that were starters were studs in this one. We had 102 and 33 yards and a touchdown through the air for uh, Rashad White. Bijan had 34 yards rushing and a touchdown, five for 54 through the air. Edmonds got you. If you had to spot start him, he, he got you by, I guess. 40 yards and then two for 18 through the air. Algier is pretty much doing nothing. Nine carries, 40 yards. I guess he's he wasn't terrible. What's that? Four, four and a half yards per carry, but. Bijan getting all the high value touches. So we're finally getting what we want from Bijan. The Bucks receivers were disappointing. Godwin, five for 53. Who? David Moore? I was like, DJ Moore doesn't play for them. David Moore, one for 11. Trey Palmer, one for three. Mike Evans, one for eight. A lot of duds, unless you had Chris Godwin. So um, 
Mike Evans, as he does, lets you down when you needed him. On the other side, Drake London finally shows up on the score sheet. He has 10 for 172 and a two-point conversion. No other uh, receiver on the Falcons was useful. The tight ends were both – actually, we had kind of three decent tight ends by tight end standards. Kate Otten goes two for 16 and is saved by a touchdown. Johnny Smith goes four for 27, puts up a decent stat line for a tight end. And Kyle Pitts goes three for 57, which isn't terrible for a tight end, but he added in the touchdown to really make it worth your day. Kickers, McLaughlin put up a 50-yarder, three for three on extra points, two for two on field goals. He was good. Koo was a total dud. I think I missed on two kickers this week, which hasn't happened all year, I think. I believe Koo was one of them. Koo and – oh, no, I haven't. Sanders is playing tonight. That's what it was. Oh, okay. Koo put up was one for three on field goals, two for two uh, on extra points. He missed some huge field goals and was probably yeah. to blame for the Falcons losing. Bucks DST had an interception, three sacks, two forced fumbles, and a safety. They were good, and the Falcons, hopefully you didn't have to start them because they suck. What's your takeaway here? So if you look at these teams, and I told you one of them was going to pass for 144 yards, like how much money would you have bet have been the Falcons in this game? Because they've been so bad passing, and of course it flips. Where Tampa Bay couldn't pass, they only did 144 yards passing. Yeah. And the Ritter throws for 347. And that shows up in the script. Like you see, it was all Drake London, really, and Kyle Pitts got there, John Smith. On the other side, like there's no passing volume. It's just nothing. And you see that with 144 like yards. It's just brutal. The, the only guy that was really good for you was, Baker was he was solid, but it's Rashad White. Like Rashad White has been fantastic, and he had another excellent game. He's just getting that volume, it's elite. It's so good to see. And then we finally get Bijan doing his thing the past couple of weeks, where he's putting up the numbers for you. Um, and yeah, like the, my takeaway, like on Twitter, I was talking about this with Drake London is like the dude's elite. He just needs the situation to improve. So takeaway is Drake London is who we thought he was. He's a very good wide receiver. And yeah, this is a brutal game for Mike Evans because uh, he was in a bunch of my lineups and just killed me this week. So. Seeing that go down, I was like, oh, I looked at the score sheet. I go, what? One catch? I was like, oh, man. Yeah, so that one still burns a little bit. And I was surprised how good Ritter was, but it's 25 points. That's really good. Like, so I guess he played him, which super flex, like, that's money. The quarterbacks aren't bad super flex options, although inconsistent. You're starting both running backs as the takeaway, and all the receivers here are pretty inconsistent. Even though the tight ends were decent, they're pretty inconsistent. So you have a lot of inconsistent assets in this one, except for the two running backs. So. Yeah. I don't know if I want to be trusting anyone in this game on a regular basis, aside from White and Bijan. Yeah, I would say Mike Evans normally is just a really bad game for him. Yeah, not great. Baltimore beats the LA Rams in overtime 37-31. I think I may have to start giving the Rams more respect because this is a couple weeks in a row where I thought they were way inferior to the other team, and they put up a better fight than I thought. They beat Cleveland, they almost beat Baltimore, and I don't think they're that good, but... Six and seven. I feel better about them at six and seven than I do about any of the NFC South teams at six and seven. But got two more great. Like it's, it was a great week for quarterbacks, even though I didn't feel like it was a. I guess it was a high scoring week if you look around at some of these scores. But Stafford goes two ninety four with three touchdowns. Um, Lamar goes three sixteen, three touchdowns. A uh, couple of long ones here. Then it looks like he also had 11 carries for 70 yards because I love the way Sleeper writes this. So both quarterbacks were studs. I'd be willing to bet they're both top. Lamar might be the QB one on the week. Yeah, I think he might be. It's a bit up there. Lamar is the QB one on the week. Stafford's the QB three on the week, so. Jake Browning, for sure. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> Running backs, we have Kyron Williams, who got a lot of work. Uh, didn't get into the end zone, but his yardage, 25 carries for 100, 114 yards, made it worthwhile. He chipped in three receptions, but for negative yardage. No other Ram running back was usable. The only uh, Raven running back that was decent was Keaton Mitchell, nine for 54, one for eight through the air. No touchdown, so he falls victim to a not great day. The receivers here continue to kind of play roulette. We actually had, it looks like, five who were usable, and I guess Aguilar wasn't terrible either. This league, it depends. This would be very dependent here. If your league carry or counted uh, return yards or return touchdowns, Tylen Wallace is probably much higher in this ranking. Apparently, this league does not count his, what was it, 75-yard punt return touchdown to win at no T, but... Mm -hmm. 
So he was much more usable depending on your settings, but so that's the only reason I mentioned him. This league, he didn't record a catch, and he was completely useless. Oh, no, it must have, because he didn't record a catch, but it gave you the six points for the touchdown, but not yeah. the return yardage. So return yeah, it probably gives you, like, the defensive special teams touchdown type thing, but, the, yeah, no yard. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have Cooper Cup goes eight for 115 and a touchdown. Puka Nakua goes five for 84. Uh, what's this, Demarcus Robinson? I can never remember. Yes, Demarcus Robinson goes 8 for 46 in a touchdown. Touchdown saves his day. OBJ, 4 for 97 and 1. It continues to scare me because he's not getting – like he got a lot of targets. He's just not getting a lot of catches, and it seems like the only reason he's been fantasy relevant of late, he seems to have this habit of just nobody covers him, and he breaks loose for one long touchdown and does nothing because, as you see, he had one. I believe it was what? 65 yards on the touchdown and then nothing after yep. that. We got Zay Flowers goes six for 60 and a touchdown with a two point conversion. Nelson Aguilar goes five for 32. The tight ends, Davis Allen comes out of nowhere to go four for 50 and a touchdown. Isaiah Likely five for 83 and a touchdown in the game where I said, if he doesn't do anything, drop him. So I guess you can continue to ride him because this was a matchup. Um, both kickers were good for you. Haversick who I thought was cut. Uh, was he not released and it was Crosby? Is this an error on Sleeper? I don't know. I didn't see who was kicking for them. So I'm going to take their word for it, but we've known. No, it turns has. in his best performance. So they must have signed right. Mason Crosby and played Haversick anyways, but go figure. So they're carrying two kickers on the active roster. Haversick goes three for three on field goals. He makes a 20-yarder, a 30-yarder, and a 50-yarder. Two for two on extra points. Tucker's three for three on field goals. He makes two 30-something yarders, a 40-yarder, and two extra points. The Rams' defense was not great. And the Ravens was, you know, decent. They were passable. Two sacks and a touchdown. Uh, what's your takeaway from this one? Um, Zay Flowers is very much the focal point of that offense. I was looking at the routes run and the snaps. He did not come off the field on any of the passing downs. Literally, he ran every route for the team. Where Odell, he ran snaps. Four yeah, weeks like in he row. ran – Odell ran, I think, 32 routes. Zay Flowers ran 54 routes. Like, I'm he assuming is this year is when Andrews goes down for the season. I don't remember yeah. exactly, but I feel like it's probably a good chance. Yeah, it's just like 98, 94, 97. <laughs> yes, they very much like him, but he is the guy on that offense. And on the flip side, you, you see the wide receivers. Puka and Cup doing their thing. Like, they were hyper-targeted in there. The Robinson thing's weird. Like, I would not expect that to stick at all. But like ten targets for him, that at least oh, yeah. catches Why your attention. Yeah, a weird right? spike here in usage. Because you would you would think it would be Tutu, right? Like Tutu's been the guy, like he's been the third option. But nope, they just started Marcus Robinson. I don't know. They must have saw something with the game. And too, the weird spike here. Robinson. I don't get it. How Cooper and Nakua were both useful, but we have two in Robinson and Allen with absolutely weird spikes in snap share. I, yeah, it is strange. Did I they mean, just, like did, did he throw a ton? Forty-one attempts. That's probably why. Yeah. Well, I didn't yeah, watch this one. They were ahead, weren't they? They weren't trailing. Yeah, and it was like it was close most of the game, and then the Rams kind of like did what they could to get it to overtime at the end. But Baltimore did have the lead, and then wow. in overtime, it, in overtime, it was yeah. a little back and forth. That's and the highest pass attempts for him in a long time. Thirty-seven. Yeah, yeah, they've been ramping up lately, but like he's to like look at the pass attempts here. He's in the twenties and thirties and forty-one here. So that's probably why there's nice a lot more. Yeah, there's a lot more people to throw to now. They're spreading the ball. Well, same thing with Lamar. 43 pass deaths for him. Like, if you get those pass attempts, that's like that's what we love to see. Um, unfortunately for Mitchell, he did not take a wow. bigger role like we wanted for the running backs. So that's a little unfortunate. But yeah, like you can't. Huh. You, I don't know why people. I were called like, it. I said a third when we said, "What do you think his snap share will be?" I said a third. It was yep. literally one third of the snaps. What was just kind of was Hill what was it was 42? previously. Sorry. No, you're good. No, um, it was what it was previously, more like regress to that. So that's just unfortunate. Uh, yeah. But yeah, like on the flip side, like Kyron Williams is just the bell cow of all bell cows. Once again, snaps, all the volume, just doing his thing. It didn't have the best game, but still 90% of the snaps, all the opportunities in the world. Like this is ideal for midi running back. So if you, I mean, the trade deadline's about to kick in a lot of leagues because this league's about to finalize. So you have a couple weeks. But if you need someone to go for the playoffs, like I don't mind, you know, going to get Kyron Williams and make the late push for your team. If you need someone, that isn't going to cost you a ton of money because people still don't value him. All right, we got to pick it up a bit because yep. we have 12. We have two. There's some through. questions in here, too. Oh, did we? Sorry. Yep. I'm on the other screen here. We will go with I need 16.3 PPR points, and I have the choice of A-chain or Saquon A-chain. 
Yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, like it's just I I think both these guys are actually gonna hit above sixteen. Honestly, like I don't mind it. And I prefer AJ now. You? Yeah, I I hate the Tennessee matchup. That's one thing that worries me. So I think I feel safer about Saquon, like getting that bar. But I think AJ has a higher ceiling. Like he could get thirty. I don't see Saquon's in that range without him. So yeah. I think Tua and Henry combined for thirty points tonight in full PPR. Yeah, they're going against Tennessee. Um. Yes, like I think Tua gets you there. I do worry about Henry. Like, no, I think really I think Henry gets you at least. I'm thinking Henry 15 to 20, and I think Tua gets you 25. Yeah. I think you you have a better chance. If, if I had to guess over under, I think you're closer to. I think you're closer to 50 between these two yeah. than 30. I would say mm-hmm. Tua Tua gets you 25 to 30. Henry gets you 15 to 20. So my what's the math like on that? 40 to 45. I, I think you're closer. You're, you're more like 40. So if that's what you yeah. need, 30 points to clinch the playoffs, you'll get there. you're good. You should be good. So yeah, you can just look at their projections. They're going to project for way over 30 combined. So yeah, like yeah. I think I think you'd be set. You're good. Tua might get you there on his own, but <laughs> moving on, we got the Bears stunning the Lions, 28-13. Lions fall to nine and four. Bears five and eight. Jared Goff was terrible. 20 completions for 161. 161 yards, an interception, and two touchdowns. He continues to turn the ball over at a ridiculous rate. Justin Fields goes 223 for it and a touchdown. Adds in 12 carries for 58 yards and a rushing touchdown, just like we all said he would. Uh, actually, that was a little lower than I expected, but still almost 60 yards is pretty solid. Um, Jameer Gibbs goes 66 yards and a touchdown on the ground, three for 16 through the air. David Montgomery, 10 for 66 and three for 19. Deonta Foreman goes 11 carries, 50 yards, two for 22. Almost nothing from Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson. So the debate of who was the guy here between Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson, the correct answer was Deonta Foreman, just like we <laughs> all expected. Yeah. Uh, the receivers, the pass catchers all around were kind of funky for Detroit. Josh Reynolds leads the way with three for 44 and is only usable for because of a touchdown. Three for 21 from St. Brown, which killed me. <laughs> Khalif Raymond goes three for 15. Nobody else relevant on that side. DJ Moore goes three for 20 and a touchdown on the ground. Six for 68 and a touchdown through the air was a stud. Two for 44 for Mooney. We'll move down to the tight ends where Sam Laporta killed a lot of us. He goes two for 23. Cole Komet goes five for 66. Uh, No touchdown, but a pretty solid game. Riley Patterson does nothing. Cairo Santos goes three for three on field goals, and he was tolerable. The Lions' defense didn't kill you, but they weren't great with seven and a half points. And Chicago's defense was awesome. Two interceptions, four sacks, a forced fumble, a fumble recovery, and four fourth down stops. This game was funky. DJ Moore seems to be the most consistent asset. I don't know what the hell happened. I thought Laporta and St. Brown were almost matchup proof in this offense. It yep. appears I was wrong. This is what two games out of three where the Lions have looked terrible against the Bears. And I don't I think, yeah, he was good last time, though, St. Brown. I don't know. What, what do you take away? This this was a weird one. Yeah, I think it's the worst game of the year for both of those guys. Like Almond Raw and Laporta have not had worse games all year. So unfortunately, it just happens. It's just It's just rough sometimes. Um, what it shows me is that Gibbs is so much safer than Montgomery because of the game script. He's going to be in the field. And if they get in these negative game scripts, he's going to be heavily involved. And this is what happened. And even in positive game scripts, he's on the field. So this is why I always prefer Gibbs over Montgomery. There's just more outs for him to succeed where Monty, like still Monty was fine. Like he didn't kill you, but just like overall, it's just a much easier path for him. And good luck with the Chicago backfield. Like I don't even want to mess with it. It's too complicated. It's too confusing, but Hey, like Justin Fields look really good. So we thought against the Detroit defense he was going to have a really good game, and he did have a really good game. Started out hot, regressed a little bit, and then kicked it off down the stretch. It's just, you know, Chicago is going to be feisty fighting for that playoff spot. They look like a solid team. So who knows what's going on with Detroit? It's just week to week, they just seem really chaotic right now. Yeah, I don't – I think I – I prefer Fields over Goff. Those two are both mm-hmm. starters. I want both Lions running backs and no Bears running backs. I think on the receivers, I want St. Brown and I want DJ Moore, and that's it. And I'll take both tight ends, even though they both seem to be have their ups and downs. And that's pretty much it for me. It's pretty consolidated here, even though the Lions yeah. guys let you down. I guess better to do it in week 14 than week 15 when it matters, unless week 100%. 15 or week 14 was when it mattered for you. Then you're screwed. Yep. 
Yeah, that would be unfortunate if you were in playoffs last week or this week. Or you needed to win to get into the playoffs last uh-huh. week, this week or whatever. Yeah, you're kind of on the guess. Yeah, because if you're rolling out the lineup of Laporta, <laughs> Amon Ross Brown, Mike Evans, and just you're just like, yeah, that's not playoffs for me. This is unfortunate. That was my uh, – not Scott Fishwell. That was my Frankenstein League. Mike yeah. Evans, Amon Ross St. Brown, Trevor Lawrence, Sam Laporta. I have Raheem Mostert still, but it's not pretty. So. At least you had Lawrence go well. But, yeah, the rest of the guys, it's just like, yikes. Uh, next up, Cincy beats Indy 34-14. Both teams are 7-6 and six somehow. Jake Browning goes 275 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception, three carries for seven yards, and a rushing TD. Gardner Minshew goes 240 and a passing touchdown, a two-point conversion, one interception, and two carries for five yards. <clears throat> the running backs, Zach Moss carries 13 times for 28 yards, four for 28 through the air. We had two awesome Bengals running backs. Kind of scares me a bit here as a Mixon owner. Mixon goes 21 carries for 79 yards and a touchdown. He adds in three for 46 through the air. Chase Brown only carries eight for 25, but he had three for 80 and a touchdown through the air. So that's scary. It seemed I had one where I was celebrating a long receiving like check down rushing touch or check down receiving touchdown by Joe Mixon, only to realize I'm like, I thought Mixon was number 28. Oh, he is. That's Chase Brown, who just took it 80 yards. So, fuck me. Like, thank you. Yeah. So thank you. That's <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh those are my other two guys in that league. I had Mixon and Jamar Chase. So, Mixon was all right for me, but Chase was not. Yeah, good. Chase was brutal. Yeah. Pittman goes eight for 95 in a two-point conversion. Josh Downs, three for 32. Mm-hmm. Two for 22 through for Alec Pierce. T. Higgins, two for 72. Jamar Chase, three for 29. Tyler Boyd, two for 23. So despite Jake Browning putting up, put up, you know, a pretty solid fantasy stat line, none of his receivers were even borderline usable. Mm-hmm. Um, Will Mallory goes five for 46. Mo Ali Cox does most of it on a touchdown, all of it on a touchdown, one catch for two yards and a TD. Tanner Hudson, two for 21, saved by a touchdown. So we have a couple of guys here saved by touchdowns. Matt Gay misses his only field goal and his only extra point. McPherson was decent, two for two on field goals, four for four and extra points. The defenses, the Colts didn't kill you. They were average. Um, one interception, one touchdown, which saved their fantasy day. The Bengals go one interception, three sacks, a fumble recovery, and some fourth down stops. They were surprisingly good, but I probably did not start them anywhere. I probably did start the Colts. What do you think here? So Jake Browning is proving me wrong that he is a capable NFL quarterback because this is his second performance in a row where after his first game, he looked just like the worst. They 41 plays, all that nonsense. The last two games, he's been really good. So props to Jake Browning. He's been better than I thought he would be. He's been viable streamer option the last two weeks, and he gets – what is it, Minnesota? He gets Minnesota next week. So if you're desperate – Minnesota's you defense guy, has probably. been better. I know. It's weird. Like, I, I still don't fully trust them. I don't the like matchups these three matchups. Right yeah. here. That's Pittsburgh one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just like – Depends on where you're at and where you're like looking through. Um, we have like Minshew who's going against Pittsburgh next week. Don't think you don't really deal with that. Um, and Zach Moss was really disappointing. We we knew he was gonna get the volume and the usage. It just did not work out at well well for him. He basically put a Joe Mixon performance where it's inefficient, not good volume. On the flip side, Mixon he's been carrying your teams with Browning and he's been really good. So Mixon had what 25 opportunities in this game. Yeah. So I get it, Brown's playing a role, but Mixon still seen a heavy amount of the workload. So if you have Mixon, you got to be happy with him. Because he's really like the only guy that's been consistent of the skill position players. And talk about Jamar Chase. Lowest snap share of the season yet. Somehow. Yeah. I, I think that's because they was just like the game got out of hand. So they kind of just rested him yeah. a little bit and they let Chase Brown get his because his snap share was at like 30%. So like it doubled from the week before and they won by 20. So it seems like it's just like one of those games. But, you know, Chase Brown could have a role moving forward. So we'll see how that works out. <clears throat> and Michael Pittman is the most consistent fantasy wide receiver in football. Like it's just. Just nonstop, just good production every week. 15, 22, 15, 12. Like, he gives you double digits every week. He gets the target. Amazing he's still only 11th. Yeah, I just, it's it's wild. It's, he's not the high-end asset, but he's just been really good and consistent. So, what he's mean, not going to kill you with these four games. 20, 28, 22, 16, 14. How is this only 11th? That's It's amazing that that's only good for 11th. He doesn't score a lot of touchdowns, targets. but. Yeah, I mean, he's already had 138 targets. He's about to set a smash his career record. And we got four more games for him. Yeah, he can be pushing 180 targets on the year. Like, that's just wild uses for Pittman. 
Yeah, yeah it's really good. Ooh, I own um, T. Thing. Higgins is just yeah, it's it's weird, man. I don't know. T. Higgins got four targets. Jamar Chase only got four targets. This game just seemed really weird for Cincinnati with how this played out. They didn't really need their wide receivers to do much. <clears throat> they involved the tight ends. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like this is sticky, but they they really just rolled. So uh, I would kind of just chalk it up to a weird game script and be okay with Chase. Um, I'm still not really interested in Higgins for the most part. It's just been disappointing. And he still continues to be disappointing, so we'll see. All right. Cleveland Browns 31, Jacksonville Jaguars 27. <clears throat> Both teams 8-5. and five. Trevor Lawrence, despite being injured, played all right, turned the ball over way too much against a good Cleveland defense. Uh, 257 yards passing, three touchdowns, but three interceptions. Joe Flacco outdoes him. Goes 311 and three touchdowns, but the difference is only one interception. So Flacco is surprisingly decent as a streamer. That's kind of scary. Uh, another injured player here, Travis Etienne, comes through, 35 rushing yards and a touchdown, and four for 37. So the touchdown probably makes his day look a lot nicer than it was. Dearness Johnson goes three carries for 12 yards and two for 16 through the air. Jerome Ford, 12 carries, 51 yards, and five for 31 through the air. Kareem Hunt carries 10 times for 27 yards and saves his day with a rushing touchdown. The receivers were all average and not great. Calvin Ridley goes four for 53. Parker Washington, two for 27. A touchdown helps, and the fumble lost hurts. Zay Jones goes five for 29. Christian Kirk out of the lineup, so I was surprised. They just kind of spread it out here. Amari Cooper goes seven for 77, loses a fumble. David Bell goes one for 41 and a touchdown. So it's all on one play and cannot be relied on. Eli Moore, I thought would do better. He was three for 42. Cedric Tillman, two for 23. The tight ends were the stars here. Every time I looked up, there was a tight end in the end zone in this game. We have Evan, Evan Ingram, 11 catches on 12 targets, 95 yards, and a touchdown. David Njoku, six catches on eight targets, 91 yards, and, a, and two touch two touchdowns for both. Sorry, I don't know if I said one or two. Uh, we'll get back into them in a second. I'm going to look and see. I bet you they are tight end one and two on the week. Uh, McManus was crappy for fantasy, three for three on extra points. Dustin Hopkins was okay, one, field, one for one in field goals, four for four in extra points. Both defensives were solid. The Jags put up one interception, a sack, two forced fumbles, and two recoveries. And the Browns put up three interceptions, four sacks, a forced fumble, one recovered, and four fourth down stops. I'm going to quickly switch over here to the stats leaders for tight ends, and it is Engram and Njoku back-to-back for our leaders. No surprise there. What's your takeaway from this one? Yeah, like it's <clears throat> interesting with these quarterbacks, but it's very simplified in these offenses with the injuries of how they're distributing in the targets. Like we see it, Cooper led the team, Njoku was second, and then is Elijah Moore third. And Njoku ma- ran more routes than Elijah Moore, which was interesting to me. I was wondering how the second game would go with that, but it really simplifies. It's like those three. And on the flip side, Jacksonville, it's really easy to tell. You look at the targets, they freaking had, was it 14 for Say Jones, 13 for Ridley? Like that's those two guys right there. And then Ingram with 12. So it's like, these, these offenses, it's really easy to decide who's getting the targets and who's not. Like, you just consolidate on those three. And then the running backs can chip in and here and there with the receiving work. But, like, it's really hyper-concentrated on those guys where we had even ETA get four targets. Jerome Ford got six, and this is because of Joe Flacco. So, like, Joe Flacco, he was going to check it down. It, like, helps Ford get there where he's basically 10 points a game. Like, you just look at his stats every week. It's 10 points, 12, 9, 10. It's really weird how consistently just average he's been. And on the flip side, like, ETN, he's just doing his thing where he's a mid to high end RB1. So overall, with the injury, I was worried about Trevor Lawrence, but he was fine. We had questions about our sister show. We're like, I guess you got to play Lawrence. I don't know. But yeah, he did okay. So overall, um, I'm curious to see with Flacco who they're going against next week. But like, he might be another guy who you want to consider streaming because he's a veteran quarterback who's proven that he can consistently guide these offenses up and down the field. It's not going to kill you. So like, they're playing Chicago next week. So. You know, I think you could do worse than starting Joe Flacco in week one of the playoffs if you're like the sixth seed and need a quarterback. Yep, Chicago, Houston, back to back. That's not a terrible option. Uh, quarterbacks, I think, are both playable. Obviously, Lawrence is the better of the two. They're going forward in ETN. I don't really want anything to do with Kareem Hunt. It seems like he's not even getting the passing downs work. He was saved by a touchdown here. The receivers are a mess. They're all over the place. Both tight ends are elite, and I don't know. 
the defenses are good, just matchup dependent. Moving on to an exciting one here. The Saints moved to six and seven by defeating the Panthers twenty-eight to six. Panthers are now one and twelve. Bryce Young goes one hundred thirty-seven yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions. He does have forty rushing yards to add in, but still sucked. Derek Carr not much better, one hundred nineteen passing yards, two touchdowns, and an interception. So, of all the good, this is the first game I think we've seen bad QB numbers, with the exception of Jared Goff. So in a good week of QBs, these two are not going to be on the leaderboard. Running backs, we see Chuba Hubbard goes 23 carries, 87 yards, two for nine through the air. Sanders was probably his best game in a while, and it wasn't great. He had 10 carries for 74 yards. Kamara in his worst game in a while. He has 12 carries, 56 yards, and a touchdown. Three, three catches for negative 11 yards through the air is an interesting stat line. Um. Through the air, uh, through the receivers here. Thielen goes five for 74. DJ Chark, two for 26. Mingo, two for 22. Chris Olave, four for 28 and a touchdown. A lot of not great numbers here by the receivers. Thielen, I guess, was the best, and Olave was saved by a touchdown, but it wasn't pretty. The tight ends are not much prettier. And for the second week in a row, Jimmy Grandpa is the best tight end for the Saints. <laughs> Two for 16 and another touchdown, which is what he's living on. Both kickers were not good. The Panthers defense, nobody was starting. They sucked. The Saints defense was awesome. They are the DST one on the week, I'm sure. They had four sacks, three forced fumbles, three or two fumble recoveries, a touchdown, and five fourth down stops. They were excellent. Uh, what are your takeaways from this? This is going to be a really weird game script. If you look at the snaps, it's all over the place in New, New Orleans just because – Carolina might be the most dysfunctional team we've seen since the 2021 Jaguar squad. They are awful and cannot do anything. Like, it is brutal watching the offense try to do, like, anything. Like, Hubbard's getting there on volume, and Sanders finally had an efficient day, but it's just so rough. I was watching that game, and you just see – there was a throw from Young to Mingo, or, like, um, around the corner where all Mingo has to do is turn to the right side, but he turns to the left side, looks the wrong way. And the ball lands five feet to his right. And it's like, dude, you could have had a white. It's just really but that team. They're, they're, that's they're amazing that that would happen. We've documented how good Mingo is at running routes. Yeah, with his body control and all that. And so, so so this, this, is, and I, this is shocking to me. I would never expect that from Jonathan Mingo. <laughs> it was so bad. I was just like, and you see Bryce so Young just throw his hands up like, good is Lord. This, Bryce Young, Jonathan Mingo, first round, second round combination, the worst one two draft pick in like the NFL history. The worst it's any team's there. ever come out with two high end draft picks. It's so it's brutal. Fucking, man. It's pretty bad right so, now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And they, they desperately need help. Like clearly they missed on Mingo and Young's just in the worst possible situation. So I don't know what they got to do, but they got to make some changes if they want to be at all competitive next year because it's a lot of the same issues. And they're tied up with cap money too, so it's a harder situation than Jacksonville. But Turns out, it yeah, the Saints right. like Carr was awful too, and you see his linemen yelling. I'm sure. Did you watch the game actually? No, like he I was, was out. The linemen were literally yelling at Derek Carr as they were running off the field. Like they were pissed at Derek Carr because like, I don't know what's going on, but it just seems like they're tired of him as well. So yeah, New Orleans got there just because they're just a better team. They have better players across the board, and like they didn't really do anything special. They just did enough to survive. Where you're playing Carolina, like that's my kind of takeaway. Oh, both these teams are probably going to struggle down the stretch. Yeah, depending on what New Orleans' schedule is, New Orleans gets the Giants, Rams, and Bucks. The Gi the the Saints could win two, uh, to three. could win three out of the last four and make the playoffs. Here they're going to lose to the Rams, I think. But yeah, that Atlanta game is going to be probably division deciding. More than like None of these teams are above 500. The Saints don't face another team above 500. Yikes. That's wild. Saints going to win the NFC South. They could. That Atlanta game is going to be for all the marbles. Watch. That's gross. Oh, this is. We have like two, three games in a row that are gross here with the Saints, the Jets game, and then that Vikings game. But Jets no, 30, no. Texans 6, CJ Stroud, not his best game. 10 completions for 91 yards. He did leave with a concussion. The uh, long neck dinosaur came in in relief. He did nothing. Zach Wilson goes 301 yards, two touchdowns, and a fumble lost. Go figure. Zach Wilson was good. 
Running backs, Devin Singletary takes back over. I don't know what the hell's going on with these two. Pierce and Singletary back and forth. 13 carries, 65 yards, and a touchdown. Pierce goes four carries for nine yards, so nobody great. Brees Hall was awesome. 10 carries, 40 yards, eight for 86, and a touchdown through the air, which is where he made all of his points. The receivers, uh, none of them are healthy. Tank Dell out. Noah Brown, he left with an injury, didn't he? Oh, no, it was Nico who left. Yeah. Uh, Xavier Hutchinson goes two for 15. Nico, one for 13. Mechie, one for six. Robert Woods, one for negative two. So not great. Uh, Garrett Wilson, nine catches for 108 yards. Randall Cobb does nothing but scores a touchdown. Same with Xavier Gibson on the rushing touchdown. Tight ends, we have Brevin Jordan goes three for 35. Ty Conklin goes... Uh, four for 57 and Jeremy Ruckert, three for 37. Fairbairn, they still haven't changed this. Come on, sleeper. Fairbairn has been out since what week 10 and they haven't changed it. It's Matt Amendola. They just don't want to do it. I don't know why. God, like, they're just refusing. They gotta be Amendola. Texas, Change your shit, sleeper. Then we have Greg Zerlang goes three for three on field goals, three for three on extra points. He is a monster day. Both defenses were decent. Texans has four, have four sacks, a forced fumble, and one recovered. Jets were awesome. Six points against, five sacks, and three fourth down stops. What's your takeaway from this other than the fact that the Texans must be the most beat-up team in the NFL? Yeah, if there's no C.J. Stroud next week, good luck starting a single play on the Texans offense. It's going to be gross. And they get a matchup with C.J. Stroud next week. Good luck starting a single player because I don't yeah, think Collins it's... plays. Tank Dell's not going to play, so you're going no. John Mechie or playing guess the fucking running back here. Um, yeah, like, that's the problem. Like yeah. it's just the targets and stuff are going to be so distributed. You don't know who's going to step forward. It's just it's best yeah, it's just to avoid it. Like, Remember know, when forward. six weeks ago it was uh, people were lining up for Texans, Stroud, Singletary, Pierce, Nico, Tank Dell, uh, Dalton Schultz. You couldn't get enough Texans in your lineup. Now I don't. I don't think there's any. Most yeah, people aren't going to be starting any of them next week. It's funny. How we were talking about them MVP. And we're like we want all the Texans and crazy how stuff changes, right? Um, but well, it's, for the it's crazy because that's how it started. It started the off season where nobody wanted any Texans. Then everyone wanted every Texan. Now nobody wants any Texans. So, so it's like a flat it's a circle, circle of life, life. man. The line. Yeah. Yep. Life. Time is a flat circle, baby. <laughs> um, yeah, Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson are just elite talents. They did what they do to get you fantasy points. It's not because Zach Wilson's a good quarterback. He's not. He had a good game, but I don't trust that at all. So good luck with that. Yeah, but Brees Hall got there with the receptions. Nine targets, 86 yards, touchdown. Garrett Wilson, 14 targets, 108 yards. Like, that's just what these guys do. They have boom weeks because they're very good talents. So, you just got to bet on them. And you're going to roll them out in the playoffs and just hope they boom for you because it's up and down with those guys every week. So, you, like, you see Brees Hall's usage and every week. He's got some boom weeks. He's got some low weeks. He's just – you just got to bet on the top. They go against Miami next week. So, and they're going to be forced to pass on a lot and get positive game trip. So, they're going to need it. So, that's what we're going to hope for. I don't even have to click on the next game to know we're going to see some ugly fantasy lines here. I wonder, okay, over under, how many players on the next game do you think topped 10 fantasy points? Oh, I'm going to, I don't even know if anybody did, honestly. I'm going to go with one. zero. I'm going to say one. What? One. Okay. I'm looking. So we'll set okay, the line we at the zero. defenses. We'll set the line at zero. Po- okay. Uh, yes, include defenses then. I'll say 1.5. Okay, and I'll take two line. then. Uh, or you, you take it. You're taking one point five. I'll take, I'll take two, two. I'm taking okay. two. Let's see. Take me over. Okay. Cool. It's not a good start. It's rough. One. It's all rough. Monte. Two. Oh my god. Good. Lord. Three, four. Oh wow. All Both defenses. defenses. Both defenses. defenses. So it would have been two if it hadn't been for defense. But anyways, good you grief. got uh, Josh Dobbs. Remember, like. A month ago, people were fighting me over Dobbs about how I said he's mm-hmm. Josh Dobbs. We're not doing this. He'll be good yeah. for two or three games, and then he'll suck. Look what – guess what? He was good for two or three games, and then he was replaced by Nick Mullins. That's how good he is, Nick Mullins. I said – I believe you said this as well. Sell Josh Dobbs. I know I certainly yes. fucking did. Yep. He, yep, yep. It's funny. That's how much they hate Jaron Hall. I don't know why they don't cut him. They went to Nick fucking Mullins. Ugh. I think it's because Jaron Hall's on the rookie contract, so they're like he's cheap, whatever. But yeah, like you can definitely just get rid of him because it's not happening for him, unfortunately. Yeah, all right, just, 60, this is a disaster. Sixty-three yards from Josh Dobbs, 
83 from Nick Mullins, not to be outdone by Aiden O'Connell, who puts up 171 yards and an interception. That's gross. Oh, yeah. Running backs aren't much better. Ty Chandler, 12 carries, 35 yards, 3 for 7 through the air. 10 carries for 66 yards for Madison, but no touchdown for either. Made it kind of a crappy day. No touchdowns. Well, I guess no touchdowns in the game. Made it a crappy day for all of them. Josh Jacobs, 13 for 34. That's impressive. 2.9 yards per carry, if my math is correct. Uh, Devontae Adams somehow puts up 12 and a half fantasy points, seven for 53. Impressive. Five for 25 for Jacoby Myers, three for 46 for Hunter Renfro. KJ Osborne goes four for 15. Justin Jefferson, two for 27 and lo left again with a chest injury. Not good. Oh, it says avoid severe injury. I thought it sounded like he was done, but. Yeah, he, he got hit on the side, so they were worried about his kidneys and stuff. But it seems like he's okay-ish. I don't know. It's just been a rough I, year for Jefferson. I don't start players in their return from significantly long injuries, so I didn't have him in my lineup anyways. So it worked out well for me because I had him on my yeah, bench. Yeah. So, I mean, I realized this was completely unrelated to his previous injury mm -hmm. and was just luck. But either way, I'm glad I left yeah. him on my bench. Yeah, I hung out to dry last quarterback. It was rough. Yeah, Addison, two for 27. TJ Hawkinson goes five for 53. Michael Mayer, one for 14. This, is, this fucking game is ugly. Greg Joseph puts up two fantasy points and is the best kicker in the game. Daniel Carlson, who was drafted as a top five consensus kicker, excuse me, is kicker 25 on the year. I know most people don't have kickers and don't follow kickers. He may be one of the biggest busts this year at kicker I've seen in a long time. The Vikings and Raiders defenses were both good. I believe the Vikings, the Vikings were definitely on my streamer article. So that was a hit for me. I don't think I went Raiders because I'm not suicidal. So um, Vikings <laughs> had an interception, four sacks, forced fumble, and two recoveries. The Raiders, three points allowed and five sacks. They got there. So... The defenses were the star of the show here, maybe because both offenses suck. Uh, yeah, both quarterbacks cool. suck. So, yeah. like, Devontae Adams appears to be almost matchup proof or quarterback proof. TJ Hawkinson the same, but, like, these offenses, Chandler and Jacobs are risky. Jefferson, yep. Addison, you're there's a lot of risky options here. Even Hawkinson, he put up a dud recently, didn't he? No, he didn't. He's yeah. Okay, so it looks like Hawkinson is 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 pretty consistent here. Devontae Adams has been decent. He's been underwhelming, but like I yeah, want TJ Hawkinson in this game and nobody else. Yeah. It's like him and Adams are the two that you can count on for floor plays if you're looking for that. But then like the thing about this game is Dobbs shielded just how bad O'Connell was. Otherwise, we'd be walking away from this game talking about O'Connell's awful. But nobody's talking about Jesus just how bad his job was worse. Yeah, exactly. So he's just saying O'Connell's not good. Rod Farmer sucks, basically. Somebody what needs is. to get him a leader of cola. <laughs> yeah, for real. Um, yeah, so it's gonna be a rough story. These guys in the playoffs. Uh, hopefully, they figure it out. I'm not even sure who they play. So Vegas plays the Chargers next week. So it's like the ideal matchup. And the Vikings play Cincinnati. So yeah, two defenses you could exploit. Um, this is going to be interesting to see who's going to be startable. But it's really just Adams, Hawkinson, and who knows what's going on with Here's Jefferson. There's going to be a lot of teams or a lot of players from these two teams in the start sit questions next week. I can yep. guarantee mm -hmm. that. Good it's matchup, like shitty game. quarterbacks. This ugh. let's move on. I'm yeah. sick of this game already. Yeah, it's rough. It's rough. 49ers 28, Seahawks 16. Uh, Drew Locke, ugh. 269 yards, two TDs, two interceptions. Brock Purdy, 368, two TDs, and an interception. Brock Purdy was pretty good. Drew Locke was good by Drew Locke standards. Kenneth Walker and Zach Charbonnet both kind of split the carries. Well, they did. Neither got into the end zone, so that's why the lower stats. Eight for 21 for Walker, four for 33 through the air, nine for 44 for Charbonnet, and one catch for four yards. CMC does what CMC does. 145 yards uh, rushing, and what is this? Oh, one for eight receiving. No yeah, touchdowns, so that was surprising. Yeah. Uh, Jordan Mason was decent. I think he got a lot of late garbage time carries, but four for 20, one touch. Oh, that's what it was, the one touchdown, garbage time touchdown. Um, receivers here, the revolving door of which Seahawk to start at receiver continues to revolve or to change. We have Lockett goes six for 89. DK goes two for 51, saved by a touchdown. 
JSN goes four for 25. That is a scary situation there. The Niners, Debo is awesome again. He has a rushing touchdown on a goal line carry. Receiving, he goes seven for 149 and a long-ass touchdown where nobody decided to cover him. Um, Brandon Ayuk, six for 126 and a fumble loss, so he was also awesome. Colby Parkinson was surprisingly good because of a touchdown, two for 28 and a touchdown. Seahawks love to do that, throw in just one random tight end touchdown to fuck with you. George Kittle, three for 76, also saved by a touchdown. Both kickers were duds. Seahawks defense was tolerable. One interception, three sacks, a fumble forced, and one recovered. And the 49ers were pretty good considering the matchup. Two picks, four sacks, and a fourth down stop. This one's got a lot to dissect and digest. What are your thoughts here? I mean, it seems to be the Niners. You start Purdy, you start McCaffrey, you start both receivers, and you start Kittle. It's pretty easy. And then you avoid everyone else. Whereas the Seahawks, that's a fucking cluster at running back or receiver. That's a fucking cluster at running back. You're disregarding all the tight ends. The Seahawks are a fucking mess, and you're the Seahawks guy, so you don't. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun for Seahawks fans right now. It's so this was my worry with Drew Locke is there's going to be some freaking issues in this game, and there was because he's not Geno Smith. We saw the offense look really good against Dallas last week, and then this week Geno Smith was going against them. Geno Smith's out, and then insert Drew Locke. And it's just just chaos. Like he had some good moments in this game, but he also had some really bad moments. Which that's Drew Lock. That's what he does. Moving forward, I don't know. They play Philadelphia next week, and if Geno Smith's gonna play, I'm gonna have a lot more confidence in this offense because Philadelphia's defense is just not good. So if they can get the points and get there with Drew Lock. I'm just gonna be very worried how this breaks down. Like you can't have this mid level split between Walker and Charbonnet and expect much of anything from these guys because no one's getting enough volume or usage to really matter. So that's the hard part. So they need a touchdown. I you hope you're right. Gino, Metcalf, but, yeah. I hope you're right and Gino plays next week because I started my matchup article for next week. And based on the best matchups, my cover right now is Geno Smith and DK Metcalf. So I sure yeah. hope Gino plays or I gotta change my fucking cover. I would start the wide receivers next week for Seattle for sure. <laughs> yeah, I went with DK because he seems to be the most consistent, but yep. I don't know. The the running backs, like it seems like you don't get that none of them kill you, running backs or receivers but it seems like you really need a tight end for any of them to be good. A tight end, a touchdown right. for any of them to be good. Sorry. Yeah. That's what DK, like, that's why DK was such a blow up last week. Cause he had three touchdowns, but yeah, it's just, it's up and down. And the Niners are like the most simple, just start those four guys and per, well, actually five were pretty. So you start yeah. the two running about the wide receivers, CMC. Actually that was like, that touchdown was like the first drive. Cause he housed it 72 yards, got tackled five yard line. In comes Mason, swoops the touchdown. I go, oh, yeah, because he was tired. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I seen. I seen. That's shitty. Wasn't yeah, even the five. It looked like it was like the three. But. Yep. Yeah. It was, it was like, no, don't take them out. But yeah, it's just, it is what it is. You know these teams. Buffalo Bills 20, KC 17. He was offside. That's all I'll say. Yep. If Josh Allen goes 23 for 233, a touchdown and an interception. One for th- or ten for thirty-two and a rushing touchdown. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, two hundred seventy-one yards passing, a touchdown and an interception. Only one carry for eight yards. Uh, so Pat Mahomes was not great. James Cook, ten carries, fifty-eight yards, five for eighty-three and a touchdown through the air. I bet you he's still top twelve, thirteen close. He is the most like most underrated, most like silently quiet borderline RB1 in in football. Like, nobody ever talks about him. Every week I have him ranked in, like, the 20s, like 18, 20, 24, and then he's 13 on the season. But um, right, exactly. yeah, we have Ty That's Johnson, good. who's still in the NFL. Uh, moving on, we have Jarek McKinnon, four for 19 and one, and then three for 18 through the air. CEH got the majority of the rushing work but didn't do much with it, 11 for 39. The receivers, Rashi Rice was great. Everybody else sucked. Stefan Diggs, four for 24. Deontay Hardy, one for 25. Shakir, one for 12. Trent Sherfield, one for nine. Gabe Davis, zero on two targets. So the people who fought me all week saying this was the Gabe Davis blow up week and that I was an idiot. Yeah, you were incorrect, sir. Thank you very much. I'll victory lap now. I'm getting very petty as the season goes on. I don't know about you. Don't blame me. It's a long season. Yeah, it's a long season. And at some point, it's like you get sick of blah, 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 blah. They're, you know, they're, ra- they're like, there's no reason. You're, you're wrong. You're going to be wrong. Just wait and see. And it's like, I told you I was right. Fuck off. 
Really, he'll give it up. <laughs> yeah, I find I'm victory lapping more as I'm getting more and more tired as the season grows to a close. Exactly. I, I, I know that before I just used to move on and I kept it to myself. Now it's like, ah, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, my, no, my, my filter seems to be malfunctioning as we get right. later in the season. But Rashi Rice, seven for 72 and a touchdown. Kadarius Tony, two for 16, three for 25 and an offside. MBS, two for 22. Dalton Kincaid goes five for 21. Knox had some targets, but didn't really factor in. I guess kind of split it here with Kincaid. Um, uh, eight targets, but he just didn't do much with him. Kelsey, six for 83, a great day. No touchdown, didn't help him. The kicker's bass was salvageable, I guess we'll call it. Two for two on field goals, two for two extra points. Butker sucked, one for one on field goals, two for two on extra points, but it was a gimme field goal. Both defenses didn't kill you, but both defenses didn't really help you. They just kind of, they're literally, my cutoff line for a usable defense and kicker is eight points. So literally, if I had started any of these three in Bass or the two DSTs, they literally did the bare minimum to, to qualify as a hit this week. And that's pretty much what they are. Just the bare minimum this week. Hopefully you didn't. Like, this is one of the times where if you had either of these defenses, hopefully you could afford to roster a second defense because I didn't want to start either. And I expected this to be much higher scoring. So the fact that it was 2017 and both DSTs still sucked tells you, you know how tough the matchup was but what do you take away from here like this this fucking the chiefs are a mess yeah they they really are it's, it's so it, rough well it's especially when we lost pacheco it's even harder like yeah. and there's like no work between edwards Lair and mckinnon and like that's why i bet on mckinnon just because <clears throat> like i thought he'd be more efficient with the receiving uses he got the touchdown which saved the difference but like it's just it's so hard to trust anyone outside of Rashi Rice and Travis Kelsey. Oh, see, room. I didn't think McKinnon would be more efficient. He did kind of what I thought. I thought he'd be involved in the passing game, and they seemed to love yeah. to give him the goal line work. And that That's kind of – I wasn't surprised I at all there. by the stat line. That's why I liked him. Yeah, but. yeah. Like, CEH is who he is. He just was not great. But, like, it's harder for that. It's the hardest it's been for that against the offense in years. You watch them, everything looks difficult. Nothing's easy. So it's just like they have to work extra hard. And going against a Buffalo team that's good, who's just been very unlucky this season, Buffalo looked like the better team. Um, but it was difficult for them as well. And James Cook was the best player on Buffalo's offense. Like, you watched the skill position players, and it was Cook that was making everything happen. Oddly enough, he only saw, like, 40% of snaps. But, like, when he was on the field, he was heavily used. So it's very strange. I don't know what's going on there. But it's like, amazing because we started the season and saying, like, if you had to pick the top five title contenders – Four of them were in the AFC. Of those four that are in the AF that we picked, well, three of them, like Bills, Chiefs, Bengals, I don't think any of the three look like they belong in the playoffs right now, let alone a, a legit contender. If you had to, like, I would say, if I had to pick an AFC champion, I'm going the North. I think it's either Browns or Ravens. Yeah, <laughs> I just, they seem like I, the AFC the looks team. like a fucking mess. It's a zoo. It's just – it's wild. Like, both these teams have been dealt with injuries and just letdowns, and it's not good. I will say, like, for the tight ends, people were worried about Kincaid. He ran 90% of routes. Don't be worried about Kincaid. He's on the field to run the routes, and he ran all of the routes pretty much. So, I get it. Um, once his face came back, what I wound up like on his name, uh, Knox, Knox. But he really did not impact his role at all. They used Knox, like, half the time. They – Kincaid ran 43 of 49 routes. Like, he's very much involved. Exactly. In the offense. Keep going. No, yeah. So, he'll be a mid-high tight end one each and every week, which is good to know. And, yeah, it's just – I don't know what's going on with Stefan Diggs, but this is another just disappointing week. He hasn't had a ceiling week in what feels like six weeks. It's just been rough. I don't – it's – I don't know what's going on. Him and – they're not connecting, so it's kind of difficult to trust him, but – He's getting the volume, so you just got to keep plugging him in there, hope it hits. They get Dallas next week, so that will be interesting. Who's that, Diggs? Yeah, it's just been underwhelming for Diggs. Even though he's getting the volume, it's just been like, man, it's just disappointing watching him go. Like this game in particular, four for 11, that's rough. Yeah. Look at the targets here, or the catches. Yeah, the targets are there. It's just, it's the just not happening for him, unfortunately. Yeah. Like, All right. Broncos 24, Chargers 7. This would have been a lot closer had Herbert not left with a broken finger, I think it is, thumb, finger, one of them. Russell yeah. Wilson, 224 for two touchdowns and an interception. He was passable. 
Herbert goes nine for 96 in an interception before leaving. Easton Stick comes in, puts up 179 yards, and loses a fumble. He's useless. Javante was good. 17 carries, 66 yards, and a touchdown. Three for 25 through the air. The Italian Stallion, eight yards, and then chips in five for 36. Eckler finally did something. 10 for 51 in a touchdown, five for 49. So the buy low window has closed on Eckler. Mm-hmm. Cortland, well, I mean, playoff or trading yep. in general is probably closed. Yep, yep. I went to do that earlier. I went to start writing my uh, my trade chart for this week, and I was like, well, I guess I don't have to do a redraft trade chart for this week, just dynasty, because you right, can't yeah. trade and redraft in the playoffs in 90% of leagues. But mm-hmm. Portland Sutton, three for 62 and a touchdown. Uh, Judy, Mims, Humphrey, everyone on the Broncos did nothing. That's kind of scary how useless everyone but Cortland Sutton was in that pass-catching group. Keenan mm-hmm. Allen goes six for 68, kind of disappointing for him. Quinton Johnston puts up the exact same fantasy points pretty much, and somehow that's a good game for him and a disappointment for Keenan Allen. He goes <laughs> three for 91. The tight ends, we had two who were decent. Adam Troutman, two for 19, saved by a touchdown. Gerald Everett was better. Five for 39, but didn't have the touchdown. Still put up more points. Both kickers were atrocious. The Denver defense was excellent. The Chargers defense was not. Uh, Denver puts up an interception, six sacks, two forced fumbles, a recovery, and five fourth down stops, while the Chargers get an interception and two sacks only. Uh, It was nice to see Austin Eckler come back to life. This Chargers, entire Chargers offense worries me. I think with Justin Herbert, assuming uh, it says they're Thursday or Saturday or something, and it already said he's not playing. So I don't know. I'm probably still going to fire up Eckler and Keenan Allen in the first round if I have to. Um, I don't really want any other charger. And on the Broncos, it's easy for me. If it's not Russell Wilson, Javante, or Cortland Sutton, I'm not playing any of them. Yeah, it's that simple. Like, the the thing for the Chargers is it kills the tight ends. Like, you get Easton Stick in there, like, you can't trust tight end anymore. You can at least fire them up with hope. Now it's just like, no, not doing this. Like, I get it. No, thank you. Um, it was fun watching Easton Stick throw a 90 mile hour fastball right past Eckler's head at the goal line. Like he was wide open, all he do is lob it, and he just chucked it like Jamarcus Russell. I was like, dude, what are you doing? There was no one around him. Um, he's not a good quarterback. So this offense is going to struggle more than it did with Herbert. So yeah, like I think what it does for Keenan is it just lowers his floor. Like he's still going to get targets, he's still going to be involved. He's just not going to have those ceiling performances. And where Eckler's going to get like some, he finally got the targets, and I was like, cool. So they're back using him that. So. Yeah, I'll trust those two guys. But, yeah, same thing. These offenses, like, we know who you're going to play. At least Quinn Johnson's a full-time player. He's, he ran, like, every snap. He's going to be super boom bust. And without Herbert, it's just not really going to work out for him. So, it's just – don't have to worry about him anymore. Yeah. So, these offenses are just disappointing in general. First round of the playoffs, there's a combined five players I'm starting in this game. So, that's... Yeah. And even, like, I don't have a lot of confidence in Devontae either. Like, it's just no, – it's me not neither. great. Yeah. Sadly, I think the one uh, maybe Eckler's my favorite choice out of all these. Other than that, it's Cortland Sutton, I think. But yeah, and then it'll be like Keenan and just yeah, you just pass everybody off. To close it out, Dallas upsets Philly 33 13. I believe that puts Dallas in charge of the division. That's something you don't see. Jalen Hurts Please. finally does not oh, score. No. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna say, I think they still own the tiebreaker because they won the first matchup between them. So I think it's Philly, but I'm not Maybe. sure. I thought, just a sec. I thought I heard in the car that it puts the Cowboys in first now, but I, I'm going to double check right now. It does. It puts the Cowboys in first on uh, – what is the tiebreaker? Point differential is the tiebreaker. The point uh, differential for the Cowboys is plus 188. The Eagles plus 21. Yikes. It's only plus 21? Yikes. It's wild. The Cowboys are way ahead of everyone. The next highest score. They, so the 49ers are plus 175. After that, the next highest is the Ravens at plus 140. And then there's only two teams over 100. Good I'm surprised God. Philly's like that close to zero. That's wild. I did not the fucking that. Cowboys are scoring. Dude, they're really good. The Cowboys are a really good team. Like, that's the thing. They are fucking all over the field. They're good. Jalen Hurts shits the bed because he didn't get himself any tush pushes. Once again, I've been pushing that narrative, so just allow me another victory lap. He goes eight for 18 for one set, 197 because I'm dyslexic, and goes five carries for 30 yards and a fumble loss. Dak, 271 and two. Good God, another fumble loss, but a decent day for Dak. 
Uh, the Eagles side here, we have DeAndre Swift, 11 carries for 39 yards. Gainwell, 4 for 28. Scott, 3 for 9. Tony Pollard has a decent day. Actually, a good day. That surprised me. I didn't like him in this at all. But to be fair, they he got more work than I thought because they were rushing out or running out the clock for more than I thought they would. Pollard goes 16 for 59 and 7 for 37 through the air. Dowdle gets a lot of garbage time work, a garbage time touchdown. A.J. Brown, 9 for, for 94 and a fumble loss. Devonta Smith, 5 for 73 and a fumble loss. How many times did the fucking Eagles fumble? Three. The three, they killed them. That's why they they had they were in uh, Dallas territory and all of them, too. And the fumbles just killed them. C.D. Lamb, 6 for 71 and a touchdown. Gallup, 3 for 48 and a touchdown. Cooks, 2 for 37. Moving on to the tight ends, Goddard goes four for 30, Ferguson five for 72, both startable. Both kickers were good or great. Elliott was good with two for two on field goals, one for one in extra points. He hit from 40 and 50. Aubrey was awesome, four for four on field yeah. goals, three for three on extra points. He hit from 40 and he hit three from 50. Good God. Wild. And they went from like 60 plus. Both yeah. defenses were good or great, much like the kickers. The Eagles were good. They put up three sacks, a force fumble, one recovered, and a defensive touchdown to save their, their day. Cowboys were awesome. They put up a sack, three force fumbles, three fumble recoveries, and a fourth down stop. So a, a defensive touchdown saves the Eagles, and the Eagles fumbling the ball eight bajillion times saved the Cowboys. So this is actually, you know, there were quite a few usable assets in this, but I bet – if there was a game with the most rostered assets in it, it was probably this one or Buffalo yeah. KC. So it's, you know, it is what they thought, what we thought they were. So, yeah, exactly. I'm with it. It's so interestingly enough, like DeAndre Swift has been really disappointing the past couple of weeks. And if you look at his snaps in this game, like Gainwell basically split with him down the middle. Same Gainwell ran more week. routes. I don't know what's going on, but I don't think, I really don't trust Swift moving forward. He's just not getting the option, and he's not getting the touchdowns either. So it's just really he hard. He's really to efficient for two straight games, and then look at his snaps. All of a sudden, yeah. just fell off. So I they wonder what try. it was. I don't know what's going on. He has it. He's one I've never seen a player from his time with the Lions where he's. It's just randomly he gets less work. What's going on? What's oh he was hurt and just nobody knew. And that, yeah, I so I'm going to bet good. there's probably a lingering De DeAndre Swift injury we don't know about, but that's pure speculation and just past history. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's, I yeah I'm just worried about him moving forward. So in the playoffs, it's going to be real questionable starting him. Um, you probably have better flex options would be my assumption. Uh, what killed the Eagles with the fumbles? This game should have been a lot closer if they did not fumble. Like we'd have been a lot better for the Eagles offense in general. So it's just. Turnovers, they get you. And this is what happened to the Eagles. Three turnovers when they lost all the fumbles. Just stopped the entire offense. So it really just destroyed everything they could have done. So it should have been a lot better game for them. Gridiron Gal 87 is Tracy. What did she do? Draft every fucking Eagle? Yeah, she said she likes to grab her players, right? Two, so it's just all the three, Eagles. Three, four. She owns four Eagles. Sheesh. But yeah, like if we look at these offenses, Pollard saw a season high in targets and receptions. CD Lamb's just. He's awesome. Like CZ Lamb's wide receiver one, basically. He's incredible. Um, yeah, like you know who you're starting with these teams. You're starting the two Eagles wide receivers. You're starting CD Lamb. You're starting Pollard. Starting the quarterbacks. And you can do the tight ends like Ferguson and Goddard. Goddard came back. He ran enough routes. He was involved. 84% of South. So he's back to kind of being who he was. So you trust the guys. Absolutely. Well, that is a wrap for the week 14 recap. Join us tomorrow, Tuesday at noon. We will do a recap of the Monday night game and we will go through the waiver wire for the first week of most team or most leagues playoffs. Thank you everyone for tuning in for Aaron and Jesse. Have a great day. We will see you again tomorrow.